afternoon and welcome to another installment of ARA's webinar presentation series. My name is Natalie Curry and I am the General Manager of Supply Chains at the ARA. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet. For me, that's based in Canberra, the Ngunnawal people, and I pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. I'm really pleased uh, to introduce our webinar presenter for today, Bruce Moore. He is the Executive General Manager of Telecommunications and Chief Technology Officer at VicTrack. Bruce is a highly accomplished ICT and telecommunications executive within the government and commercial sectors with proven capabilities to develop and implement change through transformative information technology and telecommunications strategy. Bruce is also the current chair of ARA's Telecommunication Committee. Um, I look forward to Bruce's presentation today on managing risk while adopting new technology. We've allowed plenty of time for questions at the end of Bruce's presentation, so please post your questions throughout the presentation by clicking on the dark blue hand icon in the top right corner of your screen. Today's presentation slides are also available for download, so just click the light blue down arrow resources icon in the top right hand corner of your screen as well if you'd like to do that. Today's presentation slides. Um, uh, are available, but the presentation is also going to be recorded and shared in the coming days. So look out for that email. Uh, we are live, so if you do experience any technical issues during today's webinar presentation, just contact the Redback support team, whose number is at the bottom of the page. Now I'd like to welcome Bruce to the screen for his presentation. Thank you, Natalie, and uh, welcome everybody. So again, uh, today we're talking about the rail industry managing risks while adopting new technology. This uh, particular topic is something that you know you could do a university degree on. There's so many different uh, avenues you could address. The plan for today is just to you know cover a few of the, the high level issues, uh, talk a little bit about a, a few things here and there and spend uh, a lot of time at the end with any particular questions, if there's any particular tracks people would like to go down. Uh, you're just uh, touching a little bit more on about myself. So I've been in the, uh, the technology space for about 30 years now. I've done uh, work in Australia, uh, Southeast Asia and the Middle East. We're currently with Bitchuck, been with Bitchuck for eight years. And as mentioned, I'm on the, uh, the ARA Telecommunications Committee, but also the ICT Committee for the Emergency Services Telecommunications Authority here in Victoria. So we do get the opportunity to see uh, lots of different environments and lots of different spaces, and I'm happy to share some of that information with people here today. So uh, the plan for the day, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the challenges in the environment uh, that all organisations are working in, uh, you know, in, in particular the specifics for the railways environment, Spend a little bit of time talking about risk itself, uh, getting some of the terminology, uh, common terminology in place and running through some of the basics on how to apply risk to any environment, but how you know, it is being applied in the technology space. Talking a little bit about some of the conversations you need to have and then at the end, you know, summarizing it and about the new business approaches and just sharing some of my thoughts on uh, a way to get things done. Okay, looking for some of the challenges. <coughs> so, just a few points there to give you a heads up as what we're going. So here we are. So, especially in the railways, the uh, the challenges that you know railway organisations have is that they are normally uh, state or federally owned. If they're not, then they historically they have been. That comes with a, a very risk adverse approach to getting things done across the board. Uh, Technology, you know, is also uh, quite often scares people. So again, a very adverse approach to getting things done there. And then the actual technology itself. And one of the big things we're about to see is, is the actual rate of change. So all of these factors really put the rail environment in a, uh, let's say, two steps back in terms of, you know, competing with other modes of transport or other organizations. So the big challenge we have is how do we address these? How do we approach these, understanding the risks of the rail environment, but also understanding the benefits can be achieved if things are done correctly. 
was talking here a little bit about technology and the, uh, the, the rate of change. So, you know, transport has evolved tremendously over the last 200 years, and what we're seeing is that continuing to occur. The other thing around technology and the rate of change of technologies is that it, it's a cumulative effect. What we are seeing now is that the speed or the rate of change of technology and technology developments is feeding itself. So we are not moving in a linear mode. Things are going, you know, at an exponential mode. And from uh, what I can see is that it's not going to change. So the challenges we face now are not going to go away and the risks we're facing now are not going to go away. Some of the uh, prime examples, you know, that I'm sure everybody is facing right now is the changes in the, uh, the cellular space, you know, move from 2G to 3G. 3G to 4G was faster. We're seeing the output of 5G now while 3G is still in existence. And for some of those of us still running DTRS systems, now we are still operating there realistically in a 2G environment while we're talking about 5G. The move towards the cloud systems, you know, everything is being clouded. <laughs> everything is moving towards a cloud or the Internet of Things as well which are using both those new methods of wireless mobility, but also the cloud is a different approach to getting things done. What we're seeing there is that technology is moving rapidly and the risks associated with those need to be front and center in any adoption that we want to take. The alternative challenge we have there is while technology is moving at an exponential level, organizations are not. What we find is that most organizations will move at a, a log logarithmic mode rather than exponentially. But organizations themselves are not just a single entity. You've got the organizational changes. You've got the workforce within those organizations. How are the people going to change? You've got the workspace, so how things occur there, but then also the buildings and how things are set up. One of the uh, most relevant examples of that at the moment is you know, a lot of us working remotely or working from home because of the COVID virus. Let's introduce a very strange dynamic into how the workspace, the workforce and the work envelope are operating. Now, this is something that would not have happened under the normal rate of change in organisations. It's been forced upon us and so now we're doing it. So perhaps you know, this will reduce the risk that organisations will see moving forward as to how they adapt new ways of working how they were that technology. Time will tell, but I'm sure all of us can agree here that had it not been for something like the COVID-19, we would not have had all as many people working remotely and working under the current conditions that we are through choice. And the two uh, areas I've just discussed have actually been expressed under a thing called Martex Law. Uh, we're all aware, if, if you're from a technology uh, background of Moore's Law, no relation, of course, that uh, technology moves exponentially or uh, and those things, and it's actually getting fast. That Martex law is here is just showing the change between how fast an organization will change and how fast the technology has changed. And for us, now working in this sort of environment, we can see that we're trying to match those together. And for me, the largest risk we have is how do we align these two, part, two critical parts of the organization together. So the things that uh, we need to be looking at is managing this pace of change. You know, how are we going to adapt to emerging technologies? And then how do we turn technology risk into an opportunity? Uh, there's just a couple of books that you can see. I find the first one for me was quite amusing. When I was first introduced into the railways environment about eight years ago, people said there's a right way, the wrong way, and a railway. It's one of the things that uh, you know, we as technologists need to look at is how do we get technology into the mainstream? And that will uh, go, go a long way to working through the risks. But there's also change. One thing that uh, will be constant is change and how are we going to be managing that? That said, you know, railways are operating very heavy, fast moving metal things. Uh, they don't stop quickly. You now, the safety critical systems that we're operating at can't fail. We have to be risk averse in those, that environment. That can't change. So how are we going to manage that risk averse posture? Network connectivity is becoming, you know, ever more important. Now, there was a time where, you know, the internet failing was an acceptable thing or a time when the televisions actually stopped and turned off at midnight. 
There's now an expectation TV is on 24 by 7. There is an expectation that the internet is working at fully operational speeds 24 by 7. And an expectation that the network is always on. The other thing we've seen through there is a passenger dependency. It's the expectations of the users of the technology are ever increasing. They're seeing what's the latest and greatest and they're expecting to be, you know, ready the next day for themselves. How are we going to manage those? These particular areas we can't change quickly because of the environment we're in. But how do we manage that risk moving forwards? <coughs> Some of the key things that we can do to address this, and we'll touch this on a little bit later on, is the use of standards. Uh, that can address a lot of the compliance of the obligations, which are quite often thrown up as part of the risk adverse approach to getting things. And then how do we use technology itself in our risk control systems to make the management of risk and the awareness of the risk easier itself? So uh, just a couple of things that we can do moving forward to make things simpler and get the communication and get the information out to everybody as required. The next few slides, I just want to talk a little bit about risk so that we all do have a common understanding about what risk is and, and some of the techniques that can be used. And especially one of the, the key techniques that I use quite often and I would highly recommend to people moving forward as well. So uh, the traditional aspects of risk management are here. I'm sure everybody has been across these things, tracking, monitoring, the assessment, all the way through to the risk registers. Just looking at the first two, the tracking and the monitoring. Looking at your risks, you identify a risk, you assess it, you control, and then you review the controls. It's your traditional plan, do, check, act. This applies especially in the risk environment, but the key challenge facing all of us is that this is not a static environment. It needs to be consistently reviewed. What uh, I've seen in my challenge, in my uh, adventures and my movements is that this is done particularly well in the mining, oil and gas environments. And uh, not so much, you know, in the environments, you know, rail construction. And the government agencies, uh, again, I would call that immature. Now, these are generalizations. Now, there will be specific areas that are doing it better than uh, than others, but as a generalization. And the reason why I say this, you know, the mining, oil and gas, is that they're looking at different ways to get things done while maintaining the strong focus they need to have on safety and the strong focus they need to have on security. They just seem to be moving more quickly at how they're identifying ways to manage the risk. Uh, in the rail, you know, we are getting there and there are pockets of rail. And you may even say that the rail components of the mining industry seem to be moving ahead of the game and, uh, when it comes to freight for passengers as well. So again, these are generalizations, but this is the general approach to managing risk. Here we have just an example of a control register. So if I just move back here slightly, what this too does do is gives you uh, the controls that you're going to put in place, which you then look at and review. A very simple example here of a control register, description, your plans, and your trace to how those are going. And then the fact is what these bring together is your dashboard. Now, your risk dashboard in any uh, organization or business environment, for me, is critical. And it's one of the things that we as technologists need to bring more to the forefront. We need to be bringing risk front and center and to say, these are the risks we have. Here's how they are being managed. And here are the controls we're putting in place and look at the improvement that we're making. One of the things I can recommend to everybody if you're not doing it already is to have a comprehensive risk dashboard as part of your business and as part of your project. Uh, not only does it show that you've got things in control and considering things and you can demonstrate it, but you'll find that it actually makes things easier to get done as well. Looking through the planning. So one of the key uh, terminologies that we do need to understand is the difference between a risk and an issue. Uh, a risk is uh, something that has not yet happened and there is a probability that it may. Uh, and then what you do is you put controls in place to prevent it from occurring. An issue is something that has actually occurred and what you are doing is putting in the mitigation activities to address it. 
again, talking about something very relevant at the moment, the, uh, the COVID, the changes, you know, it is an issue. Some of us may have had a situation like this on our risk registers. I think many probably did not. But what's happened now is it's turned into an issue and we've all put in place a mitigation strategy. And we have found that some organisations have been able to move faster than others because of the, uh, the pre-planning or the work, and others haven't. But well, here we have risk and the issues are the two main items. Traditionally, you see a, a, a matrix put in place, you know, rare, possible, or most certain, low, medium, high, the different terminology about how you measure your risks. And then you talk about your risk appetite. This is one of the, the key items we need to put in place. Once you've plotted what your risks are with a likelihood and an impact or a likelihood and a consequence, you then look at what the risk appetite of your organisation is. And the, uh, the appetite may be different depending upon the different parts of the organisation. It may be different depending upon the activities that are being taken. For the purposes of uh, this webinar today, I'm just taking a generalised statement of a risk appetite across everybody. This needs to come from the top of the organisation. You know, from your board, your shareholders, or your key stakeholders, to understand what is the appetite or the, the risk tolerances that they have. When you plot it in here, if you go below the line, or if it's in the blue, you know, your risks are acceptable. You will tolerate those risks and the controls that you put in place are okay. If you move above the line or go into the orange, that's where you're exceeding your risk appetite. And you need to clearly understand your willingness to accept the controls to spend money on more controls or some other activities that need to be understood. So one of the biggest things we need to understand is what is the risk appetite of your organisation? Especially in the railways, people, you know, traditionally have said, you know, risk averse and the risk appetite is seen as very, very low. While in some situations, for instance, your critical systems, you know, that is the case. It does not mean that all across your organisation or across the entire railway system that the risk appetite should be low. We can take uh, some recent advances in technology around passenger displays or automated ticketing. The risk appetite there would be significantly higher because it doesn't include any of your safety obligations. So what I want to say here is we need to look seriously at our risk appetite and the appetite we have around the deployment of our technology. But be sure not to apply a single approach to everything that you do. Look at what the technology is, what it's trying to achieve, and then you can adjust your risk appetite appropriately based upon that. I just got a small problem here at the moment. So the other thing to look at is the risk tolerance. So the risk tolerance is how you are measuring your risk. So here we've got a, an example of some risk tolerances used in, in typical projects, cost, schedule, scope, and quantity. And then you put in place quantitative measures as to the degree of or measures as to what is very high tolerance levels. So what are you willing to accept? All the way through to very low as to what you're not willing to accept. And again, this can change on a project by project basis, or it can change on a system by system basis, or an organizational business unit. So we need to be sure that you're not applying a one size fits all. And then the numbers that you put in here will depend upon the direction you get from your shareholders and a lot of your appetite. So putting these in place will enable you to work through some of your decisions that you need to make, especially using any technology selection. So one of the important things that I use then here is a match of the two, where you apply your risk appetite versus your risk tolerance levels. So again, you can see here it's a, it's a uh, two by two matrix. In a normal world, there'd be multiples of these, again, for simplicity of just doing a, a single case. We have the impact versus the likelihood on our axes. And then we've got the orange line through there, which is the risk appetite. At a very simple level, anything below the line, you're accepting and your controls are effective. 
and anything above the line is out of tolerance. So you need to do additional work. So then what you do is after you've worked through all of your risks, you plot them on this matrix and you identify where they're at. Now in this particular case here, the colors do mean something. The uh, oranges mean it's a moderate list, moderate. The uh, blues, you're talking about a low tolerance. And then the uh, maroon is a very low tolerance. So as you can see here in the far right, there's a maroon dot talking about loss of key business, decision, business systems. A low tolerance means from the key shareholders, this is not going to be tolerated. So being outside of the risk appetite level and being at a low tolerance level, work will need to be done to bring this further into here. And this is going to cost time and it's going to cost money and that will need to be incorporated into any budgets or any decisions moving forward. One of the uh, key rationales where I use you know, an approach like this is in our technology selection. So depending upon the risk appetite of an organization, that will lead you through decisions of what type of technology or where in the life cycle of technology development you'll operate. So if you have a very high tolerance levels for technology failure, you can then move into the bleeding edge or leading edge technologies because you'll be willing to accept some uh, failures or you'll be willing to accept some setbacks, either financially or performance wise. However, and this is in a lot of the areas in the railways, in the safety critical systems, you want tried and proven systems. So your tolerance levels there for failure are very low and your tolerance levels for cost blowouts will be very low as well. So a matrix like this will help you understand where do you fit on the curve? Where do you fit in the matrix in terms of acceptability of the technology? Where in that life cycle development of the technology are your selections going to be? An example at the moment is a lot of the, uh, the mobile application. So mobile applications, we do have issues around at the moment around security. So you would only move or start looking at some of these mobile applications with you know, security issues if you have a very high tolerance for security failures. So you then look at the types of data and the types of information that would be using. So that is how I use this a lot in determining you know, what technology selections and our technology roadmaps in the next five years, the next 10 years, what sort of technology decisions are we going to be making? What is our risk appetite? in the particular spaces, and what are the tolerance levels that have been set by the key shareholders or the boards in terms of what will they be willing to accept. And then the final step in looking for risk is the risk assessment. A lot of people find this a uh, very boring and uneventful part of uh, projects or of business. However, it is important, if not critical, to how things get done. Here, quite a, a, a wordy slide, but it's the approach that you go through. You know, it's seven steps and it is not a static approach either. It is something that needs to be continually reviewed to make sure that you're identifying the appropriate risks. You know, they're being categorized so you can understand, you know, where they would fit on a risk appetite approach or risk tolerance levels. You need to look at how it's been measured initially and get your gross risk. The gross risk is your starting point. Put in place your controls and then work through to your net risk or residual risk. And this then show, and then you do a gap analysis to show you what more needs to be done. It can be laborious, laborious, but it is critical in getting this done up front, either for a project, you know, in your business, or as part of your, your forward planning, in your, uh, the roadmaps or your strategies that you're putting in place. This all leads through to a bow tie analysis. Uh, very quickly through a bow tie analysis, you have a risk event, and then you work away with your risk controls, your preventions, with number five here being the most likely risk to occur. Then you look at your issues, and these are the, uh, the mitigations, with number one being the first thing you would do if the risk actually occurs. By doing this, you're putting in place your preventative activities to try to prevent the risk from occurring, but also you're planning ahead so that if the risk does occur, your mitigation strategies are already in place. They're already costed. 
and whether it be people, you know, activities or workarounds, you already know what they're going to be doing. This is one of the reasons why you know, the oil and gas and the mining industries, in my view, are quite mature. They have this planning in place because of the dire you know, safety and personal issues that can occur from an accident, but also financially. The planning here is done. Again, coming back to our current scenario with the COVID, you know, organizations that had effective business continuity plans, who had VPNs and remote working uh, structures already in place, were able to mitigate the risk of uh, you know, a virus occurring by having the workforce quickly relocate. Other organizations that hadn't done that had to set up their VPNs, had to roll out new applications, and it took a little bit longer before they were on the, on the feet. So a bow tie analysis helps you work through exactly what you're doing. Okay. Just trying to move to the next slide. Which isn't working for me at the moment. Yeah. So after you work through the uh, the bow tie analysis, you come up to an action plan, and which is just you know documenting all the things you just worked through, and then this finalizes in a risk register. In a risk register. The risk registers, you know, identify through you do your risk, your probabilities, your impact, and your risk response strategy, which may refer back to a comprehensive plan, may refer back to a comprehensive bow tie analysis. And it refers back to the work you've done around your risk appetites and your tolerance levels. So again, this needs to be a live document dynamic. Many people who work through, you know, project plans or your day-to-day -day business work, risk registers are often the last agenda item or an appendix. One recommendation I would make to everybody that this almost needs to be the first item or the second item on your agenda. Looking at your risks will help set the scene as to what you should be discussing at a project review. It helps set the scene of what you should be discussing when you're talking through your business. They're looking at the, uh, the benefits of appropriate conversations. So looking through here at some of the maturity of risk practices in organizations, uh, literacy, and turning some data into insights. One of the things around the maturity of technology in, a, in an organization, the risk practice, is how the technology is being used and how the people deploying or selecting the technology are viewing the world. What lens are they looking at? Perhaps a generation ago, or maybe less than that, you know, the, tech, the technology part of the business was siloed off. You know, it operated by itself and the rest of the business got on and did what it did. What we're finding more and more now is that technology either is the business or the business itself cannot run without technology. Simple things as using Microsoft Office or, you know, laptops or computers or your, your VPNs or video conferencing through to you know, moving the trains or you know, the uh, remote equipment using to dig the mines. Technology is now embedded throughout a business. So what that means is when we're doing our risk analysis or our risk practice, we need to be taking a whole of business lens as to how things are being done. We need to look at, you know, the environmental factors. What is technology doing to the environment? With one of the biggest factors being, how is it drawing down power? You know, what's being done with the waste? A lot of technology is now requiring more batteries as part of your contingency plans. How are we disposing of the batteries? It needs to be something that is constantly in front of mind. Asset management. What is the life cycle of the technology going to occur? A while ago, technology would last you know, a good 10 or 15 years before it needed to be replaced. You're seeing now with the latest mobile phones, you've got about 12 months. How are we managing these assets? How are we managing the life cycle? And what are the risks that we're undertaking when we do a technology selection or technology decommissioning? Health and safety. 
we're using tech now more and more in measuring safety. Uh, from a health wise, we need to start looking more and more at the mental aspects that it's having on people. Are people spending more time in front of a computer? Are people now connect, connected 24 by 7? How is it impacting people's, you know, health and safety and their mental awareness? These are the factors that need to be taken into consideration when we're using, deploying or decommissioning our technology. Internal processes, stakeholders, a number of different items here. I don't plan to go through each of those in any sort of detail. But what I do want to say is technology is no longer a silo. It's embedded throughout the organization. So technology decisions, technology practices, and how and what we do needs to take a whole of organization approach. We need to be taking and understanding the risk to the whole organization when things are being done. So some of the, uh, the ways to address these issues here is digital literacy. We need to be educating everybody and not just and go away from the stereotype where, oh, that's the tech people or that's the IT department. Digital literacy is important for everybody. We need to be making sure that everybody is aware that technology is not simply turning up, plugging, you know, loading some software and walking away. It's far more complicated. The impacts and the risks are uh, increasing because of the, the tentacles that things are moving into and uh, some of the challenges which are talk about a little bit later on about how it can impact other people. We need to go beyond the, the traditional risk requirements and understand you know, the whole of business, the end change, and how we're going to build this and get it integrated across the organization. Uh, again, and this is a, a theme I think you'll, I hope you're getting it from what I'm discussing here, is that technology needs to be part of the business. And it needs to have a business first approach. It can't just be the tech side of the business. So, and learn the KPIs or the benefits need to be longer term. We need to adapt our traditional metrics and incentives. And we need to look at the skills and the capabilities and talent that we're actually using. So some of the, uh, the incentives and the metrics can no longer be the technology was deployed. Okay. It's the tech was deployed. The benefits it was, uh, plan to achieve actually occurred, the technology is now evolving. How are the changes or the way that the tech is evolving being implemented back into the organization? Are we taking full advantage of the decisions that were made 12, 18, 24 months ago? Were they the right decisions or have things changed now? So we need to be looking at the metrics that are being applied to make sure that we're constantly reviewing the decisions made and that the uh, benefits that were going to be achieved are actually implemented. Okay. So a new world order and no, not part of the Illuminati or anything like that. We're just looking at how things are going to be changing. So we're going to look at some of the ways that technology is changing and the integrated digital possibilities and some ideas about how VicTrack is changing the way we get things done, which may move towards some ideas for yourselves. Just waiting for the next slide to come up. Uh, so living in a, an integrated digital future. So as, as I've touched on briefly in a, a couple of through earlier slides, technology is no longer a silo. You know, it, it is integrated across the business and it is no longer, you know, single systems operating in isolation to each other either. The way technology is, is being integrated, which means that touching one thing somewhere is going to have an impact. This isn't going to change. The increase in mobility, the increase in cloud solutions, the overarching uh, push on costs. We need to be driving costs down, but productivity needs to be increased. We need to be doing more with less. Things will be integrated. This is why moving back to the risk appetites and the risk tolerance levels is going to become ever more important. We need to understand 
what the appetite of your shareholders and the organizations are so that the decisions on how you're going to integrate can be made effectively. To a, a point, it's a little bit about uh, self-care as well. You need to be able to document and understand why decisions were made and the analysis that was done as things occurred. So some of the simple steps you, know, you can be looking with current practices. So just looking at the brief the slide here, there was a time where you had a one-to-one -one relationship. So a single solution was in place for a single purpose. You had a different solution in place for a different purpose. What we're finding now, especially with the advent of the, uh, the application space and the, the way that some very, very smart people are developing you know, applications, one size can fit, can fit many. Of course, this brings into it uh, the risks of failure can have a much wider, wider impact. But it also means that we need to adapt our current practices. And so the way that we use our applications and the way we, we set up our networks need to change to understand the new dynamic. The one-to-one -one is gone. Uh, in a few places where it still does occur, we are going to find in the next few years that the drivers around cost savings will move those into a cloud-based system or into a shared application space. That is going to bring up different risk controls and different risk mitigation strategies that will need to be put in place. It's a simple example here of what Rick Truck has been doing. So with a lot of our data, you know, it was, you know, very static. Uh, we had manual people collecting data. They were put into static data sets. The data model into the analysis. And a lot of this was around our asset management. What we've moved now is to a live monitoring system. So we're collecting data now on a real-time mode. It's moving into a dynamic data set, which is now enabling decisions to be made faster. There's still a long way to go, I wouldn't say we're at the end game, but in the last two years we have moved so that we're now using our data to make our technology decisions in a far more proactive manner. Doesn't mean we always get it right, but what it does mean is that we're able to have more decision decision points in getting things done. And as we're moving into the future, you know, we're looking more at a mobility. You know, there is a whole world of predictive analysis, analysis, predictive analysis out there, which, you know, especially in the railway systems with the, the widespread railway corridors, you know, will be of a significant benefit. And looking at how things can be done faster. And this is all leading towards a drive to a digital uh, transformation. Again, just for a little bit of humor, you know, the question you can ask is who led the digital transformation of your company? Was it the CIO, the CIO, or was it COVID-19? I think a lot of people are starting to see different ways things can be done. Again, we've seen a, a big step in the organizational change in the way that organizations operate because of COVID-19 and the way they're using technology. I don't think this is going to stop. We're sort of uh, open Pandora's box to a degree. So what we're going to do is we've moved from a can't do initiative to a must do or a will do. This is going to require a lot more innovation and collaboration and an agile approach to getting things done. I'm sure most people have come across the, the agile project methodology, methodology these days as against the waterfall. In order to, to manage our risk, the agile approach to delivery is a very effective way to manage your risk. It gives you that plan, do, check, act approach and it is a really good way to see whether things are going to work and fail fast. In an environment where quite often the investment for change in technology will be significant, it's a very good risk mitigation approach. And then the biggest thing we have then is education around the new processes. Technology brings with it a new way of getting things done. So it's important that that is done not forgotten. So uh, just to, to summary, a few points I did want to touch on just to make, uh, to reinforce. So from a technology perspective, the things I'd like to reinforce on is technology is no longer a silo. We can't have the siloed mentality for getting things done. It's going to be embedded and integrated across the organization. And so we need to take an organizational wide view, what technology, how we select it, how we deploy it. 
look at your risk appetite levels and your risk tolerances. That helps make the decisions on what sort of technology roadmaps you're going to have. Where are you happy to take a beating edge or a leading edge approach? Where do you want to try it and test it? It's not a one size fits all. Some of the big risk mitigation strategies, which are easy or quick wins, is to look at standards. As I've said, technology is moving very, very quickly. The standards themselves are often not keeping up. So get involved in the forums that are helping to set the standards. Now stand up and take some ownership and some leadership into driving where these things need to go. Especially in the mobile space, there's a lot of work being done as to how can we use uh, the mobile or wireless technologies in safety critical systems. There's been some fantastic work done to date, but there's going to be more needed. What it is, I can't tell you. You know, the future will tell us that. But get involved in helping to set the standards. Look at whether buying off the shelf will fit your purpose or whether you actually do need to customise. This ties back in with the standards. Sometimes, depending upon your risk appetite and your tolerance levels, buying off the shelf and just using what exists is the best approach. Look to the organisation to see where do you need to be a differentiator? Where can technology needs to be different? Or how can you just use standard technologies in a different way? One of the biggest risks we have with technology is when we change it, we break it. If it's been off the shelf, if it's tested, use that. One of the, uh, the biggest recommendations I can make to all is to hire a risk professional. Don't take a technolo technologist or a technical person who's uh, learnt risk. Hire a risk professional, especially from a, a very mature risk environment, and then teach them the technology. Have this person as your right hand man or woman and incorporate them in everything you do to make sure that you're applying the appropriate risk lens. Make sure that the analysis is being done to help you understand what it is you're actually doing. It's something that I've seen uh, done extremely well in numerous organizations. Uh, you get the right person and, and it can help save a lot of money. It can help you make the right decisions. It can help you justify why particular decisions were made. But again, it needs to be a person who understands risk at its core, not somebody who's added risk on as a, as an add-on there. And the last two points I just want to make. One is bring your risk and your risk analysis up front. Don't put it to the end. Bring it up front. It can help. And you need to educate the business on what the technology is. You know, the risks you have with the deployment of the technology, the risks that come with the technology, and provide that education so that when things go wrong, and I say when, not if, when things go wrong, you've done your analysis, you've done your planning, and you know what it is you need to do. So that was, uh, you know, skimming across the top of a lot of things about how you apply risk in the technology space. I hope some of the things I've mentioned uh, strike a chord. I hope some of the things you may be able to take away and put into practice. But uh, with that, Natalie, I'll uh, hand over to you if there are any questions. Thanks, Bruce. That was um, hugely informative. Thanks so much for all of that information. And we have had a lot of questions that have come through. So let's get the ball rolling. First question, um, this is uh, in relation to, um, to culture, I guess, in applying uh, risk. In rail, we have a lot of senior aged uh, employees. How do we change their mindset and increase their readiness to adopt and embrace new technologies? Oh, fantastic. Uh, and again, um, my answers will be very general in nature, so I hope I don't offend anybody in particular. So the, uh, the slides I showed you around the risk appetite and the tolerance are the ones I find to be the most effective in changing that, that approach to culture. And I've just put that slide back up there again. So a lot of the people worked have taken a very much a one size fits all approach to getting things done. They are quite risk averse and the way they did things is slightly different. I would suggest the best way is to use, uh, analytics, demonstrate the work has been done and show where benefits can be made and where, uh, tolerance can be accepted. So again, moving back into this slide here. Work through with them 
what does very low tolerance level to very high look like? What does it mean? I'm not saying that this will be easy, and I'm not saying it will be a, a fast journey. But again, this is where your risk professional can help educate, you know, experienced people, educate boards as to what it is you're trying to achieve and help to shift that culture. Helpful, Bruce. Thanks. Uh, another question is someone that's seeking your thoughts on uh, using newly emerging technology such as drones in aerial data capture in planning design and managing railway assets better. How um, railway industry leaders like yourself um, see this top technology being used in the future? How can it be better applied? Uh, for me, I see this as one of the, the really exciting spaces that you know as yet hasn't really been explored fully. Uh, you know, we've got the uh, the basics to make sure that the, the drone isn't going to come down and land on somebody. That's some of the, the basic technology we need to work through. But the the opportunities that it opens, I, I think, are phenomenal. The uh, the amount of data that it can collect, the amount of analysis that can enable to be done to prevent bad things. Uh, again, I'm getting me a little bit excited, so I'll try to calm myself down here. Just that for me, the time that it can save, uh, the way that we can then reallocate manpower to making decisions rather than data collection. It's just going to open things up. Uh, whether it's be preventative and just regard around your maintenance side of things, whether we can get it all into the, the BMI analysis would be the next step. So we can actually see through more than just the visual. We can get into the infrared side of it as well to understand more quickly where some of our fault points may be. And then the other side of it is just pure, from a pure safety perspective. You know, CCTV or cameras is a very stationary or a static view of the world. Drones can give us a far more dynamic view. We can then move uh, the drones around to get more information in a condensed space more quickly. The, the opportunities are endless. But drones, for me, well worth the investment in time and money to see how it can help your organisations. Uh, we do need to work through some of the policy challenges that they are going to introduce. Which, you know, forgive me, it's one of the, one of the things I didn't touch on was the movement of technology is, go, is outweighing the movement in government policy and how we're going to get policy to move, you know, with the times with technology. But, you know, drones, definitely worth a second look. Great. Uh, and we've got another question that is asking for some examples of managing dynamic risk in a live operational network and replacing technology that has interdependencies with potential unknown consequences to service delivery. Well, that's, that's a mouthful. Can I, could you say that again? Could you say it again for me, please, Matt? Yeah, I think this person is looking for examples of how to manage dynamic risk in a live operational network. Okay. So, uh, an example that I've come across with is, you know, I'll use some of the, the terminology here loosely, is around the RFID tags and the Internet of Things. So, one of the things we've done is we've put a lot of uh, dynamic data collection on our telecommunications equipment so we can understand its performance. And this isn't just your traditional uh, uh, CPU speed and memory loss. It's the temperatures, it's humidity, it's location, it's vibrations. So in being able to collect a lot of this information on a dynamic basis, we can understand whether the tolerance levels of the equipment are going outside of the uh, outside of tolerance. And then we can take the necessary action far more quickly than waiting for a failure rate. So what we're able to see is that on a, you know, hour by hour, and we only do an hour sampling, you know, how often is our equipment, you know, getting to the danger zones so that we can then change our life cycle management and change our maintenance programs to adjust it. So it's a very simple example. Uh, I'm sure there's examples in, in the operational railways around wheel bearings. Uh, and track maintenance, where you can dynamically see the change in how things are behaving. Uh, this uh, another example from I put in. We're currently running through some trials around some um, uh, predictive analysis on bridges. So when we're looking at trains or trucks moving over a bridge, what is happening to that bridge? 
what are the stresses and the strains that are being applied to that bridge? So we can pull that information back now and you can early indicators we can see which pillars are under more stress than others or you know what parts of the bridge are flexing more than they're supposed to. What this does is enables us to use data to analyze the status of the bridge rather than a visual inspection. And unfortunately, just because of the sheer number of uh, bridges that are in Victoria, those visual inspections may only occur once or twice a year, but they don't tell you what's actually happening every time a truck or a train passes over it. Mm. Okay, another question is, what are your thoughts about the technology monoculture that we appear to be converging on? Uh, I assume by monoculture it means everything's becoming technology uh, and everything's becoming technology centric. Uh, if you look at some of the uh, predictive sky fi movies of what the future could look like, it could either be really, really good or it could be really, really bad. You know, it could be the Jetsons or it could be uh, some other things as well. Uh, again, coming back to some of the uh, work that's been done now around the COVID and we're seeing a lot more people spending more time in front of computers and the screens. We are increasing our awareness of the mental health and the impacts of, you know, technology can have upon mental health. I don't think humans, or I know humans are not robots and we're not designed to be forever embedded in technology. We do need to remember that there is a social side to human interactions. We need to be looking at our, our mental health and our general health and well-being. So I think for me, it's a warning. Uh, being always on the screen, being always contactable, for me personally, I don't think it's healthy. And it's something that we do need to be aware of and uh, understand far better than what we do at the moment. Mm. You mentioned in your presentation um, about silos and the importance of um, collaboration. And this is a question that goes to that in terms of um, what initiatives, what technological uh, initiatives we should be collaborating more on in the rail industry. Um, and this person's uh, particularly referred to interoperability. Okay. Um, yeah, so in interoperability, if I just touch on that one first, and this, I'll take this one as to be interoperability be between railway organisations or even between transport modes. So, again, for me, this comes back to, you know, expanding the whole silo mentality of technology. You know, we have traditionally siloed the transport modes as well. We, we don't want to be in a way that, um, oh, I forget the analogy now, the, the, the railways of the, uh, the Midwest in America they used to do the mail. Now, they, they went out of business almost overnight because they thought they were just, you know, in the, the process of delivering mail. They weren't. They were about transport and transport of the mail. Very bad analogy, I, I know. My apologies. I just haven't got that one quite right. But I'm saying we need to get interoperability of transport modes better. We need to be able to be moving people more quickly into more places. In order to do that, we need to be able to get the interoperability of our technology between the modes better. Simple things like having your passenger display systems, being able to share different modes of uh, commuter uh, timetables in the one place. Or where we have failures in one mode of transport, we can then do something very quickly in the other mode of transport. I think not easy, but it's something that needs to be done. And then, you know, within our particular mode ourselves or within railways, the big uh, change I see there is between your traditional signaling environment and your traditional communications environment. The technology for the two, if not already, will be the same. The only difference is going to be the data that's travelling across it and the criticality of that data travelling across it. In these situations, you'll apply a different risk assessment and a different risk uh, tolerance levels to the technology, but it will be the same technology underpinning it all. So it's going to merge. The convergence is occurring. It's how we're going to manage those changes. Yeah. Another question um, is in relating uh, relation to how often we should review the risks. How often do we update that risk um, analysis? Uh, the answer is not one size fits all. You know, depending upon the scenario that you're working, you will do it more often. For, you know, if you're deploying you know, a project, you, know, you, you should be doing it, you know, on a, on a weekly basis. 
if you have a mature technology that's you know in place that's been operating you know for a number of years i would suggest you know every month you would have a review and but every quarter you'd have a far more in-depth analysis to what's happening and the risks need to look at both the past the present and the future you need to look at what has the past performance been like what what has the past cost been like what are we looking at in the future how are we looking at changing this or do we need to change it and if so how how much is it going to cost how are other technologies changing or how is our business changing so how is the technology going to keep up with it well the life cycle of individual technologies is getting shorter and shorter the life cycle to roll a new technology out you know isn't changing that it still takes quite some time so for me you know we should be constantly looking at the ri- looking at our risks case by case basis but also be sure that you're looking at the whole of business view when you're doing it not just at the technology itself yeah now the question here how do you convince railways that obtaining live data outweighs the risks associated with cybersecurity uh yes it's same question doesn't only apply to railways i think everybody is grappling with this issue at the moment weighing the access to information as against the loss of that information to uh, unwanted third parties i guess in this space i am a little bit of a pessimist you know the only sure far way to make sure your data never falls into the wrong hands is never click it in the first place or turn your technology off uh it's advice i used to give to my mother uh when she wanted to do online banking uh there are steps you can take in ensuring you've got a closed environment uh you can put in place you know your your firewalls and your relevant security uh and technology uh checks and balances one of the things that most security experts will tell you is that most data loss is done through people not through technology so it's people putting uh data onto usb sticks or printing things out or just talking to the wrong person or talking too loudly while they're in their public space we're going to have to get better at collecting this information we need it if we're going to provide safe and secure uh transport especially in the railways especially as we move towards you know high capacity trains and a high capacity signaling environment that data is paramount to running a safe organization and and moving people safely it's going to be necessary very very simply have a closed system don't use public access networks have a closed system have you you a good risk analysis done consistently hire some good third party independent risk assessments to do assessments quickly and then make sure that the access to that information and it goes to the right people for the right reasons the answer, the full answer to that is far more complicated than just the uh, some starting points the principles yeah so given the long length of um asset life in rail and and the cost of um assets will the industry always be behind the technology curve as we can't be sort of so agile and and meeting customers expectations in some instances yes so in but now that case no i know it's uh, taking a little bit on both sides again this is where we need to to be segmenting what we do and how we do it the things like you know the rolling stock that is not going to move quickly the things like our signaling systems are not going to move quickly and they're not going to change quickly but with our passengers the uh the experience we give them is something we can be more risk uh have a higher level of tolerance for we can see so roll out new wifi on on their in the train you can have more up to date and mobile access to timetables or remove timetables altogether so there are areas where we will never get ahead of the curve we have to to just sheer necessity be risk averse and therefore use the tried and tested but there'll be other places where i think you know we'll have higher tolerance levels and we can try and fail quickly in those spaces but uh again and this is one of the themes i hope it's got across it's not a one size fits all segmented down and you have a different risk appetite for different parts of the rail environment 
and then that can apply to the technology choices and selections you can make in each of those particular areas. Yeah. And we're almost out of time, Bruce, so this might have to be our last uh, question. How does Australia's rail industry compare to other industries domestically or internationally in terms of managing risk and adopting new technologies? Is there lessons we can learn from others or lessons we've learnt that we can share with others? Uh, I think in general, I think Australia is doing really well. So, you know, quite often we do look with a little bit of envy to some of the uh, technological advances being made in other parts of the, the globe, but we need to be fully aware of the rationale behind those and some of the risks that are being taken. Now, we often see the, you know, the fast trains in Japan, South Korea that have been in operation for a while, and we ask, why aren't they being done here? A lot of the uh, answers behind that are, are commercial rather than technological or risk. So Australia has got a very unique environment. We really can't compare ourselves like for like with anybody else in the world. So the things that I would recommend and the, the, uh, the takeaways I've taken from you know, visiting other organizations is we're doing a pretty good job. Uh, we do have uh, constraints that other uh, parts of the world don't have in terms of population and the commercial decisions, which allows for the investment. And that we are doing a, a really good job with the investment we've got in the performance of the railways we do have. I think we are, you know, batting really well. We're probably batting, you know, 80 out of 100, whereas, you know, a lot of other places are probably doing 40 or 50. So it doesn't mean we aren't things we uh, can learn. Strongly recommend uh, people to see what's being done in Southeast Asia. We see what's being done in Europe. And even some of the work that's currently being done in the Middle East is really leading edge. See what they're doing, learn from it, and apply it where it's practical back here in Australia. Really helpful, Bruce. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks to the participants that joined us and, and joined in in q and I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions. Uh, everyone will be sent a short feedback survey, um, so I encourage you to complete that out for feedback purposes. Uh, I also want to remind everyone that uh, these webinar presentations will continue. Uh, they occur weekly. Next Wednesday, Nicole Lockwood is the uh, presenting um, on developing a plan to manage WA's growing freight demands over the next 50 years. She's the independent chair of the Westport Task Force. Um, but Bruce, once again, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you to everyone that joined in. Stay safe and we'll catch you next time.